is I'll, I'll move to our um, uh, next presenter. So I'd like to introduce uh, 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 Mike Payne uh, from uh, Pembroke College and, and the Cavendish, uh, Cavendish Lab. Uh, he's the uh, professor of computational physics at the University of Cambridge. So, Mike, over to you. Okay. Well, thanks very much, and uh, thanks also for the uh, lightning talks, which, um, as is so often the case, uh, provides lots and lots of background information, uh, which will be useful to me because it means that during my talk I won't have to say very much. Um, and actually, just picking up on the last talk, um, when Eleanor succeeds in what she's doing, then everything I've done during my career in science will become instantly important. So um, useful, um, interesting sort of background. Anyway, what am I going to do? Um, I've been sort of asked to give the boring old man talk at this meeting, which is to sort of look back on uh, things I've learned during my time in science and maybe pass on some lessons. I'm not sure that any of them will be really of much use to, uh, to the younger generation. But anyway, let, let's just see how we go. Um, and I'm always amused when people ask me to, to talk about my career. Um, you know, I tend to say, are you really serious? You want me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we really want to, to talk about your career. And I say, OK, well, fine. Um, but what you must understand is that um, when I was young, I made three absolutely categoric decisions. And they were I was never going to do physics. I was never going to work with computers. And I was never going to become an academic. And uh, as Michael just said in his introduction, I failed on every single one of those counts about being the professor of computational physics in the University of Cambridge. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, at the moment we get all this ridiculous rhetoric about everyone must know everything and you changed your mind. And why did you? I mean, you know, and young people seem to think that they need to have their whole careers fixed in place, you know, at the age of 12 or something. And um you know, all of that is absolutely ridiculous. And so, I mean, a quote that I'm sure lots of you know, uh, but uh, I think is very relevant, is um, actually it's quite the contrary. You know, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? I mean, the idea that things are fixed, that you don't change what you do because you learn more, is, of course, absolutely idiotic and yet seems to be hardwired in. There was all this fuss about the government having to change something because they found that a thousand page treaty interacted badly with another thousand page treaty, none of which people have been able to actually read in advance anyway. And they had to tweak things a little bit. And this was suddenly catastrophic. Well, it wasn't. It's because you've learned more. And only an idiot would carry on heading into a brick wall if you suddenly found out that there's a brick wall ahead of you. And yet, this does seem to be the mantra of the moment. And it is really quite depressing um, and completely and un utterly unscientific. Um, and of course, although it says facts here, um, what we're really talking about is information. Yes, you learn more. Sometimes you only find out relevant information when you begin to do things. You know, I'm sure, you know, all your <laughs> your whole audience of postgraduate students, you know, thought that they would learn everything about their subject area and then start doing research. Well, if you do that, you know, you'll reach about 100 and die and still not learn everything about your subject area. If you're doing research, as you know, you've got to just launch in and see where you go and keep making the best decision at each point as you go through. Um, interesting, I, I'm, when I was putting together this talk, I thought I'd better, you know, find out who actually came up with that uh, that quote in the first instance. And um, if you're interested, there is actually this web page. Um, and it's not clear who actually said that thing first. There are numerous um, people suggested. Uh, probably none of them did actually say it. Uh, so it may just be made up. But uh, popful sayings are very useful guidance for everything that we do. So, um, yeah, I mean, I changed my mind in many ways, as you've seen already, from, uh, you know, not going to do any of the things I've ended up doing. Um, and, you know, I want to sort of say a little bit about what I've done. Um, very, but I'm not going to go into any sort of detail. Um, so it will be very, very high level. Uh, my email was at the beginning. If you want to get in contact with me and ask about any of the details, I'd be more than happy to do that. But that would be a very long talk and also of very little interest and relevance to uh, to most of the audience. Um, but what I've actually ended up doing is, um, well, we just heard of it, I mean, quantumness. Um, 
doing quantum mechanical simulations. Um, and so what I really want to do in the just next few slides, next few minutes, is just to explain what that means, what we're doing, um, and perhaps a little bit of motivation of why one would want to do it. Um, so why, well, now we're going to, so to try and position what I do, I mean, so I work in modeling and simulation, okay? And my favorite example, if you're trying to motivate modeling, is actually the example of car crash testing, okay? So unfortunately, we're not in a situation where you can actually sort of vote or phone a friend or do anything like that. But, um, you know, just imagine you're actually sort of doing this and voting on each of these, right? Let me ask you a simple question. How much does it cost to do a single physical car crash test when you're developing a new car? Okay, so I've got a range of suggestions there. If you feel that none of those are appropriate, you can always, in your heads, tick on a different button. Um, but anyway, what, what, what do you think it is? And what I should warn you, I mean, people who've experienced my teaching will know that I always like to sort of draw people into the obvious answer, which is wrong as a way of illustrating things, okay? So, um, you know, you might sort of think, well, you know, it's a car, you know, cars are maybe, you know, 20,000 pounds, but it's a manufacturer. So, you know, may maybe it's 5,000, but you might think, oh, no, that's far too, far too simple. It's, it's, it's got to be a lot more than that. It's sort of 50,000. Or you might think, well, I'm pushing you to 5 million. The interesting answer is that actually it's 500,000 pounds as an estimate. And what you've got to do to understand why it is that much is to look at the question, the thing that you had drummed into you at school and at university, read the question. We're talking about a physical, real-life car crash test. But when are we doing it? It's when we're developing the new car. Why do we do the car crash then? car crash test then rather than when we actually have developed the car. Well, if you developed a car, that costs a lot of money. It costs probably multi, multi millions, if not billions, to set up a physical production line in a car factory. Remember that car crash testing is a legal requirement. So you set up the production line. First car comes off the production line. If you go and do the crash test, and it fails, you have to re-engineer the production line. That is another billion pounds. So in answer to that question, the, 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 the trick, the thing you have to understand is that if you're developing a new car and you have to do a physical car crash test on it, you have to hand build the car. And so the half a million pounds cost of a car crash test is nothing to do with instrumentation, nothing to do with anything like that. It is the cost of hand building a car. Okay? So it's a, a lovely example of, of, of modeling and simulation. But of course, nowadays, car companies don't have to do that. And why not? Because of the triumph of modeling and simulation. Okay? So if we go to the next slide, we'll find out. Oh, come on. Click, click, click. There we go. How much it actually costs to do a virtual crash test simulation? Well, it's about five pounds now. That probably is out of date. It's probably down to one or two pounds. Um, and, of course, you can only replace the physical test when you're developing the car by the virtual test if the virtual test exactly reproduce what a physical test does. And the picture on the left-hand side of this slide shows how faithfully computer simulations can now reproduce a real physical experiment, okay? But that was developed over many, many years, okay? You need to develop it, the model and the software that implements the model. You need to test it. You need big computing, and we've just heard that's a really, really bad thing, but okay, you know, against half a million pounds per test, then that's probably a good thing. You need to know everything about the materials, that are involved in deforming in your virtual crash test. You need to put those into the model, so you need extensive database of materials properties, but develop that over many, many years, and you reach a point where the virtual simulation is as good as the real physical one. And then, of course, in the past, we've had Moore's Law to help us then drive down the cost. 
Okay, so, right, you save a lot of money, you think that's the end of it. Actually, it's a really interesting story, because the moment it became cheap to do virtual crash, crash test simulations, what actually happened is that the manufacturers produced cars that were safer than the legislation, because it didn't cost so much to just drag your car through the legal requirements, you could actually design ahead because it was no longer the limiting step. So that's modeling and simulation, brilliant example where it's, you know, it actually reached fruition many, many years ago. It's a mature technology and used routinely. But going back to that last point, you need to know about the materials. So moving more to the atomistics of silicon, as we've just heard in Eleanor's talk, you know, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to do lots and lots of experiments on materials, you could actually just do that part of the process, predicting material properties, just doing simulation. Okay? And better still, without even doing an experiment, without even making material, without each even getting the data that we've heard about over and over again that you need to then fit your model to or develop your machine learning model. And it kind of is, it's a very different type of modeling to the, the, the virtual crash testing and most other things. The idea that you go right back to what physics is all about, fundamentals from which everything follows from your fundamental equations. But remarkably, and this is where quantum mechanics actually gives you this ability, is exactly what quantum mechanics is all about. So, without going into numbers and equations, all of which are very, very, very straightforward in principle, quantum mechanics allows you to write down equations that when solved, where the only thing that you need to know to set up those equations, the atomic numbers of the atoms in your system, or the chemical names or symbols, it doesn't matter, you just put those in, that tells you the equations, you solve the equations, and Quantum mechanics is a theory that has yet to be proved to be incorrect. And from quantum mechanics, we can predict all those materials or physical and chemical properties of systems. So it's brilliant because we got the equation. We don't have to develop new models for different systems. We have exactly the same set of equations, whether we're talking about silicon or window glass or a metal or whatever, and just solve the equations. You've got the properties. Brilliant. But... This was known. So there's a famous quote from Paul Dirac, um, who, of course, you know, was very involved, very involved in the early development of, of quantum mechanics. And, you know, he's pointed out that once you have the equations of quantum mechanics, then essentially everything is solved. Because when you solve the equations, you then know most of physics, the entirety of chemistry, which, of course, is a trivial subset of physics. And of course, biology and every other subject are then even more trivial subsets of chemistry and so on. So basically, in principle, you have the equation and we know everything about vast swathes of different scientific disciplines. Great, except the fact we can't solve the equation for the sorts of reasons that we were hearing about in the context of the traveling salesman problem. And that's something I'll get back to later on, actually. So... What, a, what I mean, if you look at it, it's a really funny statement, right? In principle, we know everything if we can solve the equation, but we can't solve the equation. Which then, of course, raises the question of how do you know that that equation actually gives you the right answers when you haven't been able to test it? So, you know, it's kind of like a curious thing to, to, to both claim that you know everything when actually you know nothing at all. Um, and, of course, it is problematic, you know? You're, 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 you're kind of like so close to having something really useful, but you can't get anything useful out of it. So why would it be useful? Well, this has been touched on before. So Eleanor was talking about devices and being able to use devices to generate qubits for your quantum computers. This is going back to, um, you know, actually 1980s and 1990s. I've just stolen the picture out of someone's uh, PhD thesis to illustrate these things called heterostructures. So heterostructures, this was sort of wonderful um, science and engineering that got going in the 1980s, um, where you could grow different materials, one on top of the other, 
and they will be perfectly matched. You can grow them without any sort of defects at all using techniques like molecular beam epitaxy and things like that. So in this picture here, we have a diagram showing a bit of gallium arsenide, then an alloy material where you have allium, aluminium or gallium on the same site and arsenic, and then back to gallium arsenide again, and then you might put some dopants in. Um, and this was a way of, of generating novel electronic structures, uh, on it, materials with sort of particular properties that could be exploited in electronics. However, in those very early days, what wasn't known was essentially how the different electronic levels in the different materials lined up. And because it was really very important, then lots and lots of people did experiments on it. And you'd have thought, OK, well, there'd be a bit of scattered experiment. There'd be some sort of uncertainty. Um, but, you know, surely everyone would be getting roughly, you know, the same sort of answer. And it'd be down to fine little details about whether one better this is better than another. Well, actually, it wasn't like that at all. And the average conference that dealt with this was more like this. You had a situation where every different experimental group had different values for these band of sets, as they're called. Um, they even had non-overlapping error bars, all right? And everything we're taught about errors as students, you know, and make sure that everything is, is, you know, properly quantified and so that everyone will agree that you agree within the error bars. Well, there were non-overlapping error bars. It was just absolute bedlam because the conferences then just became a matter of screaming and shouting in each other and claiming that your method was better than someone else's. And it was just like, wouldn't it be good if we could just put a stop to all this and get the answer? OK, so that's the sort of thing that in principle we can predict quantum mechanically, except we can't solve the equation. So, OK, that's one example. Another example um, is another area of science that was developing again in the 1980s. This is just showing my age, of course, which was understanding and being able to, to, to look at properties um, of surfaces in more detail. An interesting thing about this technology is that, that um, what enabled studies of surfaces and atoms or molecules at surfaces was actually just being able to create very, very good vacuum conditions so the surface would remain clean. And that was what was developed in the 1980s, which then led to the whole of the area of surface science. Okay? But if you go to the very early experiments you know, on these clean surfaces, all right, you'd have some sort of material. And what you might do in a sort of you know, molecular beam experiment is you'd have a source of molecules which you'd fire at the surface. And then you'd have a detector that could look at molecules scattered from the surface. And you had, well, firstly, the experiments were slow, and you didn't have many things that you could vary. Even if you could vary more things, you know, because the experiments were slow, you couldn't explore very much. But if this is a molecule interacting with a surface, well, the surface has got tons and tons of atoms in it. The molecule might only have a couple of atoms in it. The detector's just picking up what is scattered from the surface. Your problem is, that you have measurement capability in just one or two parameters, but an interaction that is multidimensional, just like a traveling salesman problem. And the result, of course, was you know, the same sort of thing. So people would basically dream up them, you know, their, their own prejudices of what happened when the molecule reached the surface, just shown schematically with this sort of uh, you know, contour diagram here. In reality, these potential energy surfaces are massively high dimensional, all right? And people could do whatever they like. And of course, they could play around because you have so many parameters. You could play around with whatever your prejudice is of what was happening in the system and fit experiment. So what the surface physics conference is like or surface science conference is like at the same time, exactly the same thing. Bedlam, people arguing about their prejudice of the potential energy surface. No one really getting anywhere. OK, so what put a stop to all of this? Well. We know or knew that quantum mechanics would allow you, without any prejudice, because you had fixed equations, just put in atomic numbers, you didn't put in your idea of what was going on, your view of the science. That, in principle, is enshrined within the quantum mechanics. Paul Dirac says, yes, it's all there, but we can't solve it. To be fair to Paul Dirac, he then subsequently said this following sort of thing after that quote I showed before is what you really want is approximate methods that get you 
most of the way to the answer, but attractable. Okay, and that's actually very good advice to anyone doing research. Yeah, don't make it intractable. The thing was, I mean, he said this in probably about 1930 or so, and it was, well, 50 years before it was shown that you could actually come up with approximate methods that do pretty well. Interestingly, the idea, the methodology that established this, it's a thing called density functional theory, that's really not important, it's just a name. The theory itself was um, you know, proposed in 1964 and then 1965 for the follow-up publication. It took a further 15 years for everything to have come together into a tractable pragmatic solution. And that's just illustrated in the next slide. Uh, with all these things, you know, people can argue about what was the very, very, very first paper that proved everything worked. Um, but this is it's certainly one of the very earliest. Um, and um, it's showing silicon again. So thanks to Eleanor for showing you silicon. Um, it's a lot simpler than what she showed because it is just the perfect crystal of silicon. OK, but what um, these authors showed was that you could take just the atomic number of silicon, or its name, or its symbol, put that into quantum mechanical equations with density functional theory as a way of making a tractable solution, and whether on the left, this is just looking at different crystal structures, showing that the diamond structure has got the lowest energy. It also is telling us a little bit of what's going to happen if you actually try compressing the silicon, it will actually change to the beta tin structure. That's what that line is in the figure. Um, the other tables just show other properties, all of which were computed from density functional theory with the same input in the same way. And that, of course, is showing one of the great things about doing computational work. You don't need a different piece of experimental apparatus to do each different property. You all just put it into the computer and out pops the answer. So there we are. We have the realization of Dirac's vision of let's have a approximate solution to quantum mechanics that actually tells us useful information. And we're there, which is great. Except there's always a but. That's why there's always research to be done. Turned out that this methodology and the way it was implemented then was great, but it only worked for a few atoms. So silicon things around it, uh, you couldn't actually using that approach make it work for carbon or oxygen or complicated uh, many electron atoms like copper and iron. Um, and so you had, you know, even more annoying. I mean, you know, with quantum mechanics, you have, well, it's kind of in the equation and we can't possibly solve it. Then you get to this level of density functional theory and it's, well, we can actually get something useful, but we can't do it for most things that matter. So, what happened next? Well, what happened next was, having vowed I've never worked with computers, I was looking for a postdoctoral position. I visited MIT. I met John Donopoulos, who was working in this field. And, you know, John, well, OK, so let's be honest about it. I didn't get the offer to work at Bell Labs because I wasn't good enough. Um, I did get an offer to go and work somewhere else. And I won't possibly say the name of the university in North America uh, because I just found it was so boring I didn't want to go there. Um, I went to MIT, uh, which didn't have a reputation it has now at that time, and certainly not in this sort of field of work. But John Janopoulos was just like an inspirational, supportive leader. And I thought, OK, I'll go and work with John. I know he does computation, but it just means pressing a button and getting some calculations done. That's fine. I can live with that. OK, so I arrived at MIT in early 1985. And I would have just been pressing a button, getting a few simple calculations out for density functional theory, and I'd have been perfectly happy. But this is where the facts or information changed again. These two Italians, Roberto Carr and Michele Paranello, who were working Trieste, found a combination of mathematical methods that allowed you to do density functional theory calculations on somewhat bigger systems, all right? It jumped from two to eight. But that was a, quite a big deal. They also allowed you to start moving the atoms around much more freely and do dynamical simulations, and it was all very, very good. Interestingly, all the things that they put together to make this work 
were things that people had been trying, but just not put together in the right way. Okay. Rebecca Carr uh, consulted IBM. John Janopoulos met him at IBM Yorktown Heights. John immediately saw this was a way forward for density functional theory. And so he did what all American professors do, having consulted IBM, got his B. He came back to Boston. Did he come into MIT? Oh, no, 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 no. He went up to Corning Glass, got another day consultancy telling Corning Glass that this was the way of the future, then came back to MIT, called a group meeting, and I was sitting in the back, not really paying very much attention, and he was going on about the methodology, and I sort of vaguely remember him saying, and you're going to set it up. So I was kind of looking around the room to see, you know, which of his brilliant students who actually knew how to code he was pointing at and discovered he was pointing at me. Um, anyway, let's fast forward seven years, okay? And this is where I'm going to have to hand over to the people in charge because they're going to show a very, very short video clip. Remember, we had the problem of what happens when molecules hit surfaces and everyone argued about it? Well, in this video clip, we simply specified atomic numbers of silicon and of chlorine, and we just let quantum mechanics decide what was going to happen. And if it runs... Okay, so let's point out a number of things. Everything looks very fuzzy because computer graphics wasn't very well advanced in the 1990s. We actually had to use pre-production software to create these animations. The fuzzy bits are where the electrons are. So Eleanor talked about electrons. That's where they are, and they're just density contours. So yellow is high density, blue is lower density. And if we just run it once more, so the thing on the top with the, the, the green blobs is the green blobs are chlorine. So it starts as a chlorine molecule. It approaches the surface. It dissociates. See the silicon atoms are moving around. That was a, well, I mean, some people knew about that, but a lot of people thought that surfaces were just like inert and didn't do anything. Actually, far from it, those silicon atoms go chasing after the chlorine. I mean, split apart the chlorine bond, the silicon atoms go chasing after the chlorines because they want to bond to them. They want to form new bonds because that's energetically favorable. We saw all of that in the simulation. Lots of suggestions of things that happened in those potential energy surfaces turned out to be complete and utter nonsense. Okay, that's enough of the, the, the little clip, so let's go back to the presentation. Um, so, that simulation was 100 atoms. We've done 400 atom simulations. We were moving things around. We were letting the computer tell us how the real world behaved. We were showing that most of the ideas that people have proposed for why things happened were completely wrong. Uh, there's a, the reference to the paper. I won't dwell on that. Um, in fact, you know, within was it a big deal? Yeah, it was a big deal. I mean, the same year, Adrian Sutton, who was at Oxford in the materials department, used a picture from our uh, animations on the front cover of his book. You know, it was a big deal back then. It's now kind of like routine. You'd have liked to have thought the whole community would be behind you. And I can assure you, they were. They were behind us and stabbing us in the back. So, about density functional theory. What did every chemist say? It doesn't work. What did they then say? Having said it doesn't work, they then say, what is it? So they didn't know what it was, but they knew it didn't work. Okay? What did the physicists say? Why do we need more than 10 atoms? I mean, oh, for goodness sake. And um, this was a great one. Okay? A UK scientist, this is in the 1990s, for goodness sake. We were told that UK researchers are not meant to be world leading. All right? I mean, for goodness sake, this is ridiculous. Okay? Um, okay, I have a thing about the chemists. Um, this gives some sort of idea of the meteoric rise of density functional theory. Do you like the units of kilopapers? So this is thousands of papers a year. That, I mean, some estimates, I mean, you can see this, this runs out 2011. Some estimates are about 30,000 papers a year published with density functional theory. Remember all those flaming chemists saying it doesn't work? Well, in 1998, they gave the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to a physicist, the person who developed density functional theory, Walter Cohn, and rewrote history to pretend that they were always interested in it. All right? It really is sickening. Okay, so I know I've only got a few minutes left, and I meant to give you some lessons. And one of these actually has been touched on sort of already, and they are lessons I've learned from my science that I think tell us an awful lot about where we are and what we're trying to do in science and as humans in our life, okay? So Andal's Law, for those who go back into the prehistory of, of, of uh, 
computers was um, basically was, was just a, a touch base get real about using either faster processing units alongside slower ones or using many processing units in parallel computers or perhaps even you know, using quantum computers in the future. And what it says is, you know, it's all very well putting off part of your calculation to a much faster processor. But the problem is that depending on the relative speeds, you're going to be limited by the slowest bit of the computer. OK, so if you talk about multiprocessor computing, right, you may be able to put large amounts of it onto the multiprocessor bit, but there will be a rump that can only run on one processor ever. And depending on what fraction of the calculation it is, that will limit how fast you can actually run the calculation. And any further effort you do speeding up the fast bit is completely another wasted. You've got to do the hard bit. OK, so what does that reflect in terms of, you know, real world? Well, capability is limited by the weakest link. And I suppose if there's one thing I get so annoyed with academics about, uh, well, they've always done this. I mean, you know, the thing about academic research is you can define your own problem. Yes. And academics do have a wonderful tendency to essentially solve the trivial part of the problem and then pass on the difficult bit to other people. And I would like, you know, I, I hope that lots of you in the audience want to do important, useful things, in which case think about the whole solution. Think about Will the whole thing work together? Don't just focus on one bit that's easy. If you can't make progress on everything, if everything isn't fit for purpose, then you may do something wonderful, but it's not going to get to the real world. And as I said, you know, I kind of lost it with academics because they're really very poor at that. The so next, and I think this is, this is a sort of, you know, life dilemma problem. Um, so we already had reference to the traveling salesman problem in one of the lightning talks, the difficulty of working out your perfect route between every single city, minimizing that path and how quantum can actually help you do that. This was actually a very relevant question in the early days of computers. I mean, we talk about so far ago where your adder unit was actually several different pieces of silicon. And so you had to connect them with wires and the same with the multiplier and the same with the memory. And you were getting to the point where you had computers had so many different things that had to be put together. And you were trying to sort of minimize the amount of wire and the amount of time and all the rest of it. And it was it basically equivalent to a traveling salesman problem. And you were reaching the point where you were spending longer working out the solution to that optimum path problem than the lifetime of a computer. Clearly intractable. So actually, it's, it's, it's physicists who solved this problem. And it is that method of simulated annealing. All right, we heard about quantum annealing. So simulated annealing is finding a way of getting to a good solution, but probably not the perfect solution until you get your quantum algorithm working perfectly. But you find a good solution in tractable time. And I'm not sure if you've found this yourselves. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time sort of advising students on what they should do, where they should go into academia or industry and all the rest of it. And, you know, what I think we're very good at doing as humans is very rapidly getting rid of the choices which are poor. And then do you find this, you know, you spend hours and hours and days and weeks trying to decide between the last three. And the reason it's difficult is because there is no definitive answer. Actually, it's not like the traveling salesman problem. Go right back to you know that slide at the beginning. Your information will change as you learn more about the things. Yes, let's say you're applying for a number of jobs. All right, you don't know about the organisations till you go in there. Okay, and when you go in there, you might suddenly find one place has got brilliant coffee machines and brilliant breakout spaces, and suddenly you know your information has changed. And what would be the point of solving that traveling salesman problem? Actually, that you need to make progress, get rid of bad choices. But once you've got down to a bunch of good choices, actually, it really doesn't matter. And you probably won't know the final discriminator until you start progressing down that line. And I'm running out of time. I've only got one slide to show. It's my, well, series of slides that all linked together. So my advice as, you know, postgraduate students who want to, you know, move on. What you have to do is make sure your work stands out from that that other people are doing. Okay. Now, 
nowadays everyone says, oh, I'll do that by doing 110% effort and blah, blah, blah. It's not about that. It's about positioning yourself. So you're doing something that stands out. Now, if you're better than everybody else, it's straightforward. If you're at the same level as everyone else, how do you make yourself stand out from the crowd? Well, go and do something that other people aren't doing. Okay. Right. You've got to be seen nowadays. All right. So if this isn't happening already, make sure it's actually one of the jobs of the supervisor. Be interesting if this is part of the contract that uh, the, uh, the National Physics Lab have as part of their postgraduate supervising you know, contract. You've got to be seen. People don't read the literature anymore. So if you want your work to be noted, you have to be presenting it. And if you're presenting it, people understand it's your work, not your supervisor's work. So demand that your supervisor do that. OK. All right. If you want to continue in academia. All right. I think probably my advice would be don't. But anyway, if you do. Reflecting some of my comments earlier on. Choose a postdoctoral supervisor who will at least allow you to do some of your own work, independent work, as well as doing the day job that you have to do on the research project. OK, but ideally, if you're going down the academic route, the way you really show that independence, do things that other people aren't doing is get yourself a fellowship so that you actually are beginning to do your own independent research and as I say, develop your own research identity. And with that, I'll probably overrun my total time, but I will stop. Thank you very much indeed. Great, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I do have, I think we've got a couple of minutes. If you could, I, I've got one question that has come in, if you could answer it in a couple of minutes. So uh, Richard B has asked, how do you determine objectively the fidelity of the stimulation? I used to work in testing and modeling and simulation of aircraft, and it is not yet certain that we can do this. Oh, okay, so I mean, you know, what we are doing is we are predicting properties of materials, uh, some of which have not yet been made. So you make the prediction, and then, you know, if it's within range, someone will go off and do the experiment. And if every time they do that, they basically, as I say, we're, we're not doing quantum mechanics exactly. We don't expect perfect fidelity. So, you know, we're talking about typically two or three percent accuracy. So if you're within that, then, and you've done that quite a number of times, yes, of course, you know, there might be exceptions. There are certainly cases where density functional theory works really, really badly, which is why we want these quantum computers, so we don't have to use this approximate method. But there have been plenty of cases where people predicted, you know, new materials, you go away, you do the experiment, and sure enough, you find them, or you find that if you press on a material like that silicon, it changes to a different crystal structure. Endless um, predictions of that sort of change, which have then been verified experimentally. So it's really a vast body of predictions then verified by experiment. But if I'm honest, the real value of this technique is not to say, oh, we don't need the experiment, because actually complexity will always get you in the end. It's put the two together and an understanding and move your field by the insight that the modeling can put alongside your experiments. Great, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, entertaining and enlightening all at the same time. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>